back to the rosé. Um, um, one of the reasons to come back is to say with, with complete conviction, it was the best years of my life. And one of the things that I loved about the Jose as a school was that it provided me enough self-confidence that when I went to subsequent schools, nothing stopped me. And uh, I went to MIT and studied architecture and then realized that my future was computers. So don't worry about what you study. Don't worry about the directions you take, but just be willing to change them. And I changed them and got involved with computers, but with a perspective of design. And one of the very first things I did is help create TED. TED is 30 years old. A dear friend of mine founded it. And the TED, if it wasn't said in the introduction, stands for technology, entertainment, and design. And the first one was actually a failure. It was not a success. And when the first TED happened 30 years ago, people did not think a second one would happen. And it took five years for the second one to happen. And then the second and the third and fourth. But when I spoke the first year, I spoke for two hours and a half. And I promise you I will not do that. I will stick to my 18 minutes today. And I'm going to talk to the subject of frontiers in a way that when you mix English and French, frontiers without borders is literally the subject that I'm working on today, personally. And it's the concept of connectivity for the last billion people. I wrote a book a little over 20 years ago called Being Digital. And it was translated in many languages and people applauded it for predicting, that it had predicted things that today are indeed happening. But there's one thing I mispredicted, I completely got wrong. And that was the belief 20 years ago that the internet would make the world a more singular place. That we'd be a more connected and a more understanding planet and that nations would basically disappear. That nationalism was a disease and that the frontière in the, in the sort of border sense would start to become very porous. Well, that didn't quite happen. It will happen, but it didn't happen as well as it should, as fast as it should, and in fact, in some places, it's going in the opposite direction. Nationalism is becoming worse, and certain things uh, are really in need of pretty quick change. So connecting the last billion interests me because it's a technical problem. It's not a regulatory problem. It's not a business model problem. You can connect the next billion people in the world by making some small changes. But the last billion people don't have electricity, they don't have cell phones, they don't have schools. In other words, you're starting off from a very, very basic uh, point with basically nothing. So I look at connectivity as a human right. And when you do that, the only qualification, sorry, the only qualification that is required is that you're human, that you make this available. Now, many people don't like the idea of connectivity as a human right, because connectivity particularly cell phones, have been a very good business, even in the developing world. And one of the things about human rights is they're free. You don't pay for a human right. And so connectivity as a human right means free telecommunications. And that is not a very popular opinion. Now, one of the sort of areas that I spend time thinking about these days is what is the difference between a mission and a market? And when I started One Laptop Per Child, and I'll show you some images of it momentarily, I was doing it as a mission. I was a nonprofit organization. My mission was making sure that ignorance was 
eliminated, that you could have education throughout the world, learning by everybody. It wasn't a market. I wasn't trying to sell laptops. In fact, we would give them away. Why did one do that? Because it was a civic responsibility. And civic responsibilities in some countries, United States being one of them, are not popular. It's not a popular concept. And competition doesn't work for everything. In fact, many things in this world do not happen through normal market forces. I even wake up in the morning and will ask myself, what I'm doing today, will normal market forces do that? And if the answer is yes, stop. And let more normal market forces do it. My job, I think of this way personally, is to do the things that normal market forces will not do. Now, in 1982, I became involved in bringing computers to Senegal, Pakistan, and Colombia in very remote locations. The internet existed, I was very much part of it in the early days, so early that I actually knew every single person on the internet when I started using it. It wasn't called the internet, there were only about a hundred of us. Uh, it was uh, not, it had, hadn't grown that far. In fact, people who quote invented the internet, and I was very much there at the time, had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea that this would grow into what it grew into. And I remember in the 80s asking people at meetings where many of the people in the room were the inventors of the internet, saying, how many people do you think will be on the internet in the year 2000? And numbers thrown around the room were numbers like 30 million, 40 million, 50 million. And I said at the time, a billion, and everybody laughed and said, oh, Nicholas, you always say things like that. And uh, I was right. It really did grow to a billion um, by the year 2000, end of the year 2000. Uh, it hit those kind of numbers. Now, today, I won't say it's stalled, but it's plateaued in the sense that the people who can be are knowingly or unknowingly sometimes, and it's stalled for other reasons that can be changed. But back in 1982, when we were doing things, sorry, doing things in, in schools like that, the kids, actually the kid in that uh, uh, image, didn't speak English, didn't speak French, but played that keyboard like a piano. And what we learned way back then was that there was no difference in that child's behavior on those keyboards with almost no instruction as there was the child who had gone to a very good school, maybe even the Jose. There would be no difference in their ability to navigate and pick it up pretty quickly. And it was almost 20 years later that I personally got back into this and built some schools in Cambodia and connected them. Actually, it was my son who connected them. And these kids in that picture were, are in the village in the picture that had no electricity, no telephone, no nothing, and an annual income of $40, uh, $40 a year. And when they took those laptops home that were indeed connected to the internet and you can see a satellite dish in the back and generators, and this was all, there was no electricity in the village except in, in that school. And when they took those laptops home, the parents loved it because they illuminated the house. The kid opened the laptop to use it, and that was the brightest light source in the house. And I said, wow, this is, a, this is real and metaphorical, and let's see if we can do this at a very, very large scale. And that's when I started One Laptop Per Child. I don't want to talk too much about that, except to just go quickly through it and say that the idea was to build something so inexpensive that every child could have one on the planet. And it also cranked and wound up and, and did all sorts of cute things. This is about 10 years ago. Um, did it with the United Nations. We were a nonprofit. It struggled because companies really didn't like it. 
but uh, countries did. And these, this kind of picture is important because I wish I had the before and after. This is the after, but the before picture, imagine this teacher sort of standing with the kids in rows and sort of corporal punishment is a little bit part of the, of the education system and the kids are too nervous to ask a question and everything's recited and this is the way that they were doing it with the laptops. And these kind of images over the next seven, eight years uh, represented, uh, for me, a pretty good example of what could happen if you put learning more in the hands of kids. Because when you dropped off, and in this case we did about three million of these uh, laptops, the kids picked these up very, very quickly. Um, so I ran an experiment, and the experiment was the following. Could you take this to an extreme? The extreme would be to go to a village that has really nothing. There are about 100 million kids in Africa, maybe even as high as 150 million, who are in villages that are over 20 kilometers from a school, from electricity, from all these things. And what would happen if you dropped tablets off in these villages with no instructions, no people who knew anything about them, could the kids take it from there? So we did that. We dropped the tablets off. Now the only piece that I have to tell you is one day before we brought a solar panel into the village and showed an adult how to connect it to a car battery and sort of leave it outside instead of inside. Otherwise, left the boxes basically at the edge of the village, closed. The difference was that these tablets were hot in the sense that when you touched them or opened them, it recorded what you did and so on and so forth. It took two and a half minutes for the first child to find an on-off switch to find out really what was, you know, how to turn this on. It took five days for them to use, on average, this is 25 kids per village, 50 apps per day. In two weeks, they were singing ABC songs, and in six months, they hacked Android. <laughs> no literate adults, no school, no help, nobody coming in telling them what to do. Once a week, somebody came in and swapped SIM cards so that we could download their activity and observe from a distance. So when I saw that, I said, well, this really is a message, at least to me, that connectivity is the missing piece. Because these tablets, now they cost about $49 to make. You could drop them out of airplanes, you could make them, I mean, you, all sorts of things you could do. That, that make that not the problem. So I decided I would look at the problem of how do you connect the whole world for free? Now free means that somebody else pays, in this case, the $2 billion. But $2 billion is not a big amount of money. It's what the United States was spending in three and a half days in Afghanistan. So three and a half days in Afghanistan and connecting the whole world are kind of you know, it's, if the money were fungible, the mon that's not a very big number. And the idea is, really comes from Switzerland, and that's why I, I will, you know, dwell on this, on, on this particular slide. And it's the, it's the line item called a flower box theory. Because you can put satellites up, use pieces of existing satellites, launch your own satellite, do all sorts of things, and we're looking at all of them, and get signals basically everywhere. But the question is, how do you distribute that down below? How do you get somebody to receive the signal, because not everybody can be a satellite the size of this, this carpet or a little bit smaller. You, you, you want to distribute it. And the concept of viral telecommunications really, to me, comes and, and I lived in Switzerland a fair amount after being at the Jose, and I remember driving through villages, especially in the spring and the summertime. And one of the things that you notice when you drive through a Swiss village is that it's really quite beautiful, 
because, amongst other things, but particularly because of the flower boxes. And you realize the, the theory of flower boxes is that each person, for what totally different motivations, is planting some flowers in one or two or however many flower boxes they may have. And not all flower boxes are perfect. Not all, the, they didn't necessarily coordinate them. Uh, but as a group, as a sort of as a whole, where many people are doing little things, it works. It's an example of viral communications in the sense that a lot of people are doing little things that collectively work, and you could do the same things for telecommunications. And the reason I list World Connectivity Organization, which is a totally fictitious UN organization that I invented in my mind, um, is one that could in fact be created to do the following. You have regulatory, and this is true in the food and agriculture aspects of the United Nations. Um, you have agriculture that is done from an administrative point of view, like the FAO in Rome, and then you have people delivering food, like the World Food Program, uh, also based in Rome, but totally different organizations. And they're like commandos. They, they push it out there. Uh, telecommunications doesn't have that and telecommunications needs it. So what you could do, and I liken it here, is, is create a world organization that connects people on the ground, that connects them very, very rapidly. Because the last billion people, if they're connected, will leapfrog what would otherwise take an enormous amount of normal, traditional, kind of development. When I listened to one of the speakers earlier and realized what was the difference between the century that I was born in and the century today, and the difference is the digital world. Now, yes, there are many things about attitude and sharing and so on and so forth that are absolutely true, but the digital world is the new world. When I came to the Rosé in 1957, the word bit, B-I-T, was not even 10 years old. It hadn't existed in the English language for 10 years by, the, by 1957. So you, you look at sort of something that happens that fast and the change which I happen to be at the period where it changed very quickly, but people in the audience who are graduating from the Rosé and who, even younger people, take it so much for granted. And the key is to have the whole world take it for granted, because then maybe the disappointment I've felt over the past 20 years that nationalism flourished instead of disappearing and that frontiers and frontiers didn't become as borderless as they should, maybe they will in the next 10 years. And let's hope so. Thank you.